The views and opinions expressed by guests on the podcast are their own and do not reflect the views of the podcast creators, hosts, or that of Blue Door, CAEH, or their partners. The podcast may cover sensitive topics and discuss triggering issues. Listener discretion is advised. The content is intended for informational and discussion purposes only. Thank you for tuning in. Stewards, as this podcast is recorded on. In York Region, we recognize we're on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, and that this is the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. In Vancouver, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, whose presence on these lands continue to this day. Welcome, welcome, Housers, to another episode of On the Way Home. I am your host, Michael Braithwaite from Blue Door. Let's talk about Blue Door. I am so fortunate to work with over 100 individuals doing incredible work for people experiencing homelessness across Peel, York, and Durham region, just north of Toronto in the province of Ontario. Uh, Blue Door, amazing organization. We have core pillars around housing affordable housing, whether it be emergency, transitional, permanent. Uh, we have a special program called Inclusion, INN Inclusion for 2S LGBTQ plus youth, a transitional living, amazing supportive program. We have a construction social enterprise. Listen, one of the things that we've learned is that if we're going to build the millions of homes we need across this country, we need people to build them and we need jobs that pay a living wage. Our construct program does that. It helps launch people into the workforce to build those homes. It pays them a living wage. It pulls them out of poverty. An incredible, incredible program. Check it out at bluedoor.ca and all the work we do at bluedoor.ca. If you want to become part of the solution, volunteer, get involved, check out our website. We do this in partnership with our good friends at the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness. What a national force uh, when it comes to messaging around ending and preventing homelessness. Uh, the Alliance does so much work around advocacy, training, they do a massive conference that's happening in uh, October this year, or sorry, end of October, early November, the fall uh, in Halifax. And today we have one of the presenters on uh, that we'll talk about in just a minute. They do that and so much more. Check them out at caeh.ca. If you want to become a Built for Zero community, and trust me, you do, check them out and they can make that happen. So today we want to talk about, we have a guest, we're talking about veterans homelessness. Um, and I think quite often we think about homelessness, people don't think that veterans can possibly be homeless. You know, they, they go out and they serve our country and they come back. And how is it possible that they fall through the cracks? But unfortunately, it does happen with three to five percent of people experiencing homelessness identifying as being veterans. And so what do we do for them? And today I have with me Alan um, Mulawishan, who is with me. He is the director at uh, Veterans House Canada. Uh, a great guy. Alan is a veteran himself, 40, served for 40 years, uh, just opened a new housing project in Ottawa that he talks all about. He tells us about Veterans House Canada. We talk about what does veterans homelessness look like across the country, why it's happening. I uh, share some wonderful stories of the people he supported, him and his team with the new house that they opened in Ottawa, how there's a waiting list. He shares hopes for the future, uh, lessons learned from opening that house and what, uh, what they might do a little different if they were doing it over again and what they hope to do in the future. It's a great conversation about an important topic, veterans homelessness that we don't talk enough about. I think sometimes, you know, September, or sorry, November 11th rolls around and we recognize uh, those who serve, but listen, we should be recognizing them all the time. Just like all Canadians, there's a right to housing and we have to take care of our veterans. Uh, Alan talks about the average age, he was surprised that it's actually an older Canadian, an older veteran that's experiencing homelessness. It might not be an immediate thing after their service a little later on in life, whether it be from trauma, addiction, family breakdown, all the same reasons many people experience homelessness. We have a great conversation about it. He's a wonderful man and has served our country well. He will serve you well in this podcast. Let's go to that now. Alan, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Uh, I so appreciate you taking the time to spend a little time with us and educate us. 
No, my, my pleasure being here, Michael. Thank you for the invite. Alan, we ask uh, every guest the same first question. Um, and because it's important, it's very personal. And that is, what does home mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's funny. So my background is I'm a career army officer. And so, I mean, we used to joke what home means to me. Home is where the army sends you. Um, <laughs> and so it. we moved about 15 times through my career. My three kids, two dogs, my, 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 my wife. Um, and so, you know, home really was the people around you and your friends because it wasn't the structure because we move so often. That's amazing. So, yeah, it, it very, you know, not often uh, does that answer involve the structure. People talk about stability. Actually, it was just it was just described to me. Uh, the funniest answer I think we got is a place where your stuff is. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's, that's fair, though. right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's fair. It's true. Um, Alan, talk to me a little bit about your journey and how you got into the work you're doing now. You, you just touched a little bit on it, but, uh, you know, you went from uh, officer to now working with veterans experiencing homelessness. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't to deliberate, I guess. I mean, so after a long career in the military, which, you know, spanned 40 years, um, eventually you got to figure out what you'll do when you grow up, right? When, when you leave the military and I'm going to talk about this later, it's that transition. And so I had to go through my transition. What's next for me as I leave the military. Um, and I was aware of the veterans house Canada project in Ottawa, uh, through work. I was at a, I was at an, in fact, a Senator Vernon White held a kickoff opening, uh, you know, launch in the Senate of Canada. And I happened to be there and I thought, wow, what, what a neat project. And then it would be a couple of years later, um, you know, as I was retiring, um, because I had met some people there, I was actually approached to see if this would interest me, you know, to, to join them. And as I thought about, you know, what I wanted to do with my life afterwards, you know, it really struck me that this is something that I could, I believed I could do good. Um, it, it interests me. I know I've got a passion for it, a veteran myself, you know, so all, all these things. And I, I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to, you know, the military is a military, but it's also government. I didn't want to do government. I didn't want to do sales. Like I wanted to do something good and so, something good um, in veterans was great. So I have had a very steep learning curve about housing because if you ask me about housing, I'm okay with real estate having moved so often, but understanding housing, affordable housing, you know, the housing crisis, I've been on a journey these last couple of years. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, let's talk about veterans homelessness in canada now i think you know everyone deserves a safe place to call home but i think it's extremely alarming to people when they they talk about veterans people who have given their lives to serve their country then experience homelessness uh, how does that even happen how does it happen to veterans why is it happening and how large of an issue is it across our country yeah, so if I could tackle those backwards, so how big is it? It's a great question, Michael, because there is no, you know, solid answer. There's no by name list across the country, although, you know, there's obviously attempts to do that. You know, the government of Canada recognizes between three and 5,000, you know, homeless veterans. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, 35,000 people at any one day, 300,000, you know, over the course of a year, you, you know, you do the math and you're in the thousands is what it comes down to. But statistically, you know, it's somewhere around... 5% of all homeless people are veterans, yet veterans only make up 1.7% of the population. So you can see the over-representation there. Yeah, absolutely. And what, so let, let's go to the second part of the question. How the heck is this happening? They, they yeah. go, they're in the military, their military service ends, and they like, and you would think, is there nothing in place to, to support them coming out? How do people, in your experience and, and through the stories and, and people you've chatted with, how is this happening in, in a country like Canada? It is amazing. And there are many people that honestly, you know, don't believe they are homeless veterans. Like I, I've talked to people that refuse to believe it. Like, what, 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 what are we doing as a charity? Like, that's ludicrous. There's no homeless veterans. And sadly, there are, as you know. Um, and, and so I, th I think a couple of things have to come out. First of all, is that so most home, you know, homeless veterans you know, have not done a full career. Like I, 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 had, a, I had a great career. You know, I left at a full pension at a senior rank. Uh, my family's still intact. My health's still intact. Um, so kind of, you know, kind of the poster boy, right? Um, most of those people have not done that. So they haven't got a full career. They haven't got a pension. Uh, they may have released for reasons that were not their choosings, for example, a medical or a mental health issue. 
Um, and so they, they, they were not ready to transition. Um, and they suffer the same issues as anyone else going through homelessness and that, you know, affordability being a big one these days, you know, health problems, be that mental or physical. And, and there's a whole other side of mental and physical on the military angle as well. And of course, addictions. Let's not, let's not forget that. Um, but it's that transition that is really what makes a military veteran different. You're leaving a lifestyle, uh, a purpose, a sense of identity in the military. The reason you get up in the morning, you put the uniform on, that pride, that structure that's around you uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces, and a culture that you're part of. Um, and you lose all of that. And if you're not ready for it, that will start your, your downward transition. And so what you see, you know, most people that are veterans that are homeless, you know, again, they didn't do a full career. They probably did, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 years. They don't have a pension. Um, but again, it's that the reason they left um, and how they transition. Um, today, there is an organization in the Canadian Armed Forces called the Transition Group, um, which is only a couple of years old. And now everybody releasing through the forces has to go through it. And they look at all these factors. They call it the domains of wellness uh, to make sure you've kind of thought of your next steps through. So I, I went through that a couple of years ago and I retired. But the people that are homeless now, they never went through any of that. That didn't exist, you know, up until a couple of years ago. Um, so I think, you know, there are steps being made, but it's not, you know, it, it's for today. It's not for in the past, which is what we're suffering. People are suffering right now. And so I think they really, it is it is that transition that they go through. And it's everything, you know, finding a family doctor. I mean, in the military, if you don't feel well, you just go to sick parade that morning. You, you don't worry about getting in line with emergency or, again, trying to yeah. do all the things everyone else does. So so it's actually, you know, in some ways, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty neat. Um, and so it, it is a big step. And again, I'll go back to my transition. Took a lot of thought, a lot of planning, and I was in a good place. Um, so if you're not necessarily in a good place, if your family, personal life, your health, there's a lot more worries and stress. It, it, it is a, a tough road. That, that is fascinating. I never thought of it that way in the transition from a, one life uh, to another. How much does trauma play a factor? I think, you know, you, I believe you were in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so the trauma of the different things that you see, depending on, you know, what you're doing in, in with your military service, but does that play a factor? Uh, untreated trauma, that would be, and people coming back and experiencing homelessness? It does, and everyone takes trauma differently. Uh, yeah, so I mean, not everybody, you know, is homeless, you know, is, is that classic, I hate to say it, the Rambo stereotype, coming back from war all messed up, right? Suffering PTSD. So that, that is not the, the person, but throughout your career, you know, there's stressors, uh, you know, there's there could be trauma. You may not have deployed overseas, but, you know, we have people killed on training all the time. Um, you're still dealing with that group environment. There's still the stress of the life. There's a stress of moving every couple of years. There's, there's family pressures for prolonged absences. And so it all just adds up. And so it doesn't have to be like one uh, traumatic moment of, of a firefight in Afghanistan. Uh, but there could be multiple little things that have built up that have added to those stressors um, that add up. So I think it's an absolute um, you know, piece and military's got some unique uh, aspects about it, you know, as much as any first responder, uh, but the military's just got a little more unique and, and some of the things that, that, you know, that we do and just, the, you know, the kind of the danger every day, just even training and working on the equipment and the, uh, what we, you know, weapons and things like that. Sorry, if I keep saying we, I have retired, honestly, I just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough habit to break. For 40 years, I think you're entitled <laughs> to, to, to say we. Um, so let's talk about your organization, Veterans House Canada. Uh, tell me a little bit about it. What does it do? What, what is its purpose and mission? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so Veterans House Canada is a, a national charity that you know helps homeless veterans by providing permanent, affordable, and supportive housing uh, to them. Uh, so it's a housing first principle, which I mean, everybody's probably very familiar with, is that in order to you know, have wraparound supports, you, you need to wrap around somewhere, and, that, and that's housing. Um, and so we provide permanent housing. So it's, again, a little different. It's permanent, not you know transitional, and it's not a shelter. Um, uh, and I'll go a little bit more in a sec there, but you know affordable. So again, we run subsidies and have to people be able to afford it and supportive. I mean, all these veterans, you know, have their own unique story, their own unique needs, and so we try to be the, provide those supports. And again, I'll talk about that a bit later because one of the fantastic things about a being a veteran-centric organization, veteran-centric housing, is we can tap into veteran-centric support. 
but no one else can. And I think that's, that's a really important point. But so back back to us. And so this was recognized in 2017 here, 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 here in Ottawa. And through an awful lot of effort uh, through our sister charity called Multi-Faith Housing Initiative, um, really pushed to build veterans housing. And so we're able to obtain about an acre of land on the old Canadian Forces Base Rockcliffe here in Ottawa through Canada Lands Company. Um, and, you know, starting in 2019, uh, the Andy Carswell building was started. So it's 40 bachelor units, um, three stories, 40 bachelor units with common indoor and outdoor spaces um, and really centered around that supportive um, culture of everybody being a veteran. And so a bunch of plan of care charrettes were held, a lot of consultations on the design, on the mental health programs uh, were brought into place. So, you know, broke ground in 2019. Uh, you know, lo and behold, what happens in March 2020, of course, the world stops. Um, and so needs to say, um, there was a bit of a challenge building during COVID. Um, but uh, persevered and we did. Uh, and so in February 2021, 18 months, as a planned 16 on the build, only lost two months, which I think is amazing and a credit to the, to the team. Um, we opened our doors. Um, very, very cool night. Uh, people, you know, we had some veterans lined up coming out of shelters, coming out of, you know, bus, bus stops and things like that out of their cars. Um, and so we opened up and we slowly rented up over the next, you know, probably eight, nine months because you can't bring everybody in at once. That would be mayhem. Um, and so we slowly rented up and it started to bring in some of the programming in. Again, a challenge during COVID. But within that year, uh, we fully rented up. All 40 units were full with a wait list. We've since had tenants move on uh, for various reasons. And we've actually, to this day, had 58 homeless veterans uh, call the Andy Carswell Building home. And we are full to this to this day with a wait, waiting list that's growing. We, we, it is, we've had a waiting list, a small waiting list since we opened, but in the last months, you can really start to see some of the pressures on society. We're getting uh, calls from Kingston, Toronto, BC, uh, trying to move uh, homeless veterans here because we have this building. Wow, that's that's amazing, and congratulations uh, on that much needed build. What has the community response been? So, community response has been really good. So, you know, uh, we're part of the Water Ridge Village uh, community. Um, so, again, right where the old base rock cliff is. You know, I think the trick is to to get in there early to have that community interaction, which which we did, and we'll do in all future builds. To make sure you know they understand you know who who we are um and i think we're a little bit lucky because you know veterans have there's a there's there there's a, a patriotic spot in people's hearts for veterans right and they understand what they've gone through and so i think there's a bit of a bit of a you know built-in um support uh, for for the project um and it which has been great and so but i think it's just really is getting into the community talking to them and you know working towards you know demystifying what's happening what the people are all about oh for, for sure uh and you mentioned a little bit before you want to talk more talk to me about the supports you provide yeah thanks michael yeah so i think there's, there's uh, kind of two sides and i'll talk about our internal ones first so we provide uh we have a full-time social worker on-site community developer um that you know who basically works with the the tenants and runs programs community programs that's everything from you know uh, personal fitness trainer. So working again, rehab, working the fitness side, working, uh, you know, activity, healthy living uh, type thing um, to art therapy, to a, uh, we have a dog training program, we have dog park um, in our, in our, in our, on our campus. Um, and so we've got, whether it's service dog or, or pets and like, for example, we allow pets, shelters don't. Again, a quick story. What a young uh, female veteran who was couch surfing, she had her beautiful German shepherd dog uh, who was her constant companion. She couldn't get into a shelter. She couldn't stay anywhere because she had a, a dog. Then she heard about us. She came in, she moved in with us, and she was able to stay with us. And again, I won't go into specifics, but within six months, she was able to resolve what was going on in her life. She had the stability of the address. She had a place where her dog could be. She had the dog park where the dog could go out. And then within six months, she reunited back with family after having worked through some of the issues and has moved out since, since then. And so just just to show us having these the, these facilities available. Um, and there's some that they're, you know, kind of I call it art therapy. We've actually got uh, veterans who 
do fly fishing and fl uh, fly tying with with our veterans um, as part of the program. So there there are, you know community outings. There are a whole bunch of them. Um, and again, we listen to what what our tenants would like. If they said, hey, we'd like to try this. Well, let's try this. Let's see what sticks, right? Um, and all that money, that's all fundraised money um, that, that we, the Veterans House Canada, you know, uh, brings in so we can bring in, again, this is a personal trainer or, again, a specialist. Um, for example, we have a horticultural therapy gardening, which has been incredibly popular, to be honest. Um, amazingly so. But on the other side of the coin, too, is that what our, uh, takes up more time than we, we thought that it would. And we, again, we're kind of measuring and adjusting as we go. But so it's linking up. Um, our tenants with other supports they need outside, again, professionals, you know, yeah. the, the mental health, the, the, the doctors, the, that whole side of it. But this is where the power of being veterans is because we can tap into Veterans Affairs Canada. Um, they're a bit bureaucratic uh, working through them, but they have a whole hockey sock full of supports and, and, and they're fantastic that way. But obviously, if you're living in a shelter, in an encampment in your car, couch surfing, you're not, you know, getting on the Wi-Fi, logging onto my back account and filling in the forms, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's just not happening. Um, and so a lot of veterans out there are entitled to these supports. They're just not accessing them. Either they don't know about them or it's just impossible to, to get them because of their life situation. And so just being able to move into, again, permanent housing and they call it the power of an address, right? In fact, you've got an address where you know you're going to be today, tomorrow, or the next day. Um, and so then they can, uh, you know, link up. We try to, the, our staff or other great resource, the Royal Canadian Legion. And I will sing the Legion's praises, you know, till the cows come home. Um, I, I was just going to say, uh, Alan, sorry to jump in there, that we've had discussions before. Uh, so Blue Door, the organization I work for, is a uh, provides emergency housing and housing. But we've had conversations with the Legion where they said, did you know, if you have veterans that are coming in, here's what we can give them. And to what you were saying before, most veterans do not, and either did we. So, yeah, hats off to them. Sorry no. for interrupting. No, no, I, I, no, you're absolutely right. And just, you know, so the reach is, and the, the reach is national, right? Which is the wonderful thing about the, the Legion. They've got 1,300 branches across the country, plus all their other structures. Um, and so they have something called the Veteran Services Officers who are trained to help veterans work through the bureaucracy of Veterans Affairs Canada. So they'll sit right beside you know, a veteran and take them through the paperwork and how to fill it in and that. And so um, it, it, it is just, again, a, a resource um, that, that is available. Um, if any of the veterans need anything, when the first, first come in medicine, we've had the Legion step up to buy their medicine um, as they're going through, you know, the process. And so I think being able to tap into these organizations uh, that, you know, support veterans and that, you know, uh, have these you know, again, supports that other people may not have readily available, dedicated towards them, is a really powerful tool. Do you do, you do any peer-to-peer uh, -peer work? You talked about veterans, but I mean, it, it's like uh, we do a lot of, we have peer navigators of different people in the sector that, hey, you know, there's a bit of a sense of, I know what you've been through, I've been there. Um, and my story might not be exactly the same, but we've got some common ground. Is it similar with veterans? Uh, absolutely. And um I mean, a, a veteran will sniff another veteran out in a heartbeat. Um, and so we certainly have that. So we have uh, the organization called Soldiers Helping Soldiers uh, who patrol the streets in uniform looking for homeless veterans. And they, they come in once a week um, and, you know, do a little barbecue and work with the veterans. We've had a couple of uh, local veteran farmers um, who have come in, again, uh, since retired, but have had their own journeys and their own struggles, came in, provided some uh, you know, some, some meat and, uh, food for the, and they did a barbecue and we were able to talk to, again, to have that common language, that common, you know, culture and understanding as veterans. Uh, we've had a couple of, uh, large organizations come in, the defense contractors, for example, who a lot of, a lot of military veterans are employed in them have come in and they've been able to have those conversations and I, and I see it, I mean, so again, as a veteran myself, to be able to go in and have that common language, that common understanding um is is, is important um uh, because it's tough if, it's tough to break in if you don't absolutely absolutely i mean trust is everything with these conversations now listen despite your best laid plans everything is is you know you put it together uh sometimes things don't always go the way we want or if we had a do-over we might change <laughs> things let's talk about lessons learned 
Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> lots of those. I mean, so again, it was before I joined, but I think they did a really good job of consulting, um, and then really, you know, you, then you measure and adjust from here. So I think a couple of you know uh, things to look at is that from there's the structural building, like what do we get right in the building overall? You know, again, it, it is it is a beautiful building. I uh, encourage people to look at it online. Uh, it you know it it's not an institution; it, it's a home. It, you'd be proud to live there. So that that's a positive. But just some of the you know, just day to day use of some of the rooms, like doing programming, how do you divide room? How do you have privacy? Um, how do you do counseling? Um, and so we need more private spaces, more places where you don't have to walk through the whole crowd to to get somewhere. And so just a, a better use of, of that side of it. Um, staffing. So we've got a you know housing manager who does the, the day to day rents and all you know movements, move outs, all that that you know background stuff. And then again, a full time, um, uh, you know, in house social worker who she's been doing wonderful work, uh, but then is really being torn between the case management and the community development side of it, and is is not a veteran. And so we found that right now it's probably too big a load for her. So we're looking at how how do we serve our tenants better. And one of the initiatives that we're doing right now is I'm looking at hiring a, a veteran to come on staff to kind of be that link, be able to talk to the tenants and help. So be staff, but be a veteran. Um, and so that link between, because our staff members, you know, a lot of the, the professionals aren't veterans. And so even our social worker, she's not, she's wonderful, but not a veteran. Yeah. And so there, there's a translation loss there, right? And so this is one of the things we're, we're gonna try for future, you know, uh, and here in the RD Cause Building in Ottawa and see if it works for future. You know, and then really it's just then some of the programming, it's listening to what works, what doesn't work, what do we try, what, you know, what flops, um, what do they, what do they ask for more and where do we get some residents? Um, and probably the last lessons learned is that um, we're not for everybody, everybody's not for us. And that's a hard thing sometimes. Um, so it is, so it is batch three units. So first of all, so it's not families, it's not, it's not couples. That being said, most of the homeless population are single. You know, it's male, male, females, fine. There's, there's no difference there. We've, we've got a, we have many females in as well, but some people just, again, in their journey, aren't ready for living in a community, aren't, depending on how they've been living, probably aren't ready to be, to, to move in, uh, to, to a place where, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. There, there are rules that you have to follow by. I mean, again, um, you're on a lease, you're, you, you know, you've got to pay rent, you know, you're responsible for damages. Um, and some people just, you know, wherever they are on their journey, just aren't quite there yet. And so I think our lesson is to get a little better at screening, uh, but you also don't want to say, it's tough to say no, because like, where are they going then? Right? Like, but where you, else you, want, you want them to be successful, right? Yeah. And if you set them up for failure, knowing that this housing option may not be the right housing option, yeah. you know, you, and we see that too, where we're like, hey, you know, we put people in uh, one of our transitional programs who probably need more of an emergency response and, and we almost set them up for failure. So yeah. I think it's just being fair. This is not, there's not one pro veterans program for all. This is for hopefully some or most. I'm hoping maybe you can share with me if you can recollect maybe one or two stories uh, coming out of the work they've done, conversations you've had. You shared the one about the uh, woman with the German Shepherd, which was wonderful. Any other uh, stories uh, that you, you're able to share? Change the names if you need to. Yeah, well, I'll use no names, but um, yeah, so I'll go back to so the power of an address. Um, and so we've had people who have not filed their taxes for, let's say, a few years, right? Um, and so and people off, like, you know, if I file my taxes, I'm going to owe money. Well, with an awful lot of the programs these days, actually, if you don't file your taxes, you don't get money, um, be it all the various programs, right? And so we had one of our tenants, and I can't remember exactly how many years, but it was, you know, more than three, maybe less than 10. Uh, filed his taxes, you know, and got it, you know, to all the rebates, GST rebate, climate action initiative, and all those other things from the governor of Canada ended up with a check of 30 something thousand dollars a couple months ago. Why? Because he had an address and he got support and he was able to file his taxes. It's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, we've had some people that just, you know, it's watching their journey at their own speed. Again, people have come in um, and don't want anything to do with back. And there's a lot of that. You talked about trust, Michael, and you really hit the nail on the head there, uh, the trust factor. Um, and so it's trying to, you know, uh, lead the horse to waters that you are entitled to these things. I don't want to talk to back. You know, I don't want to go through this again. It's like, yeah, but you know what? 
there are things here for you. And it's, it's just that journey. It's them seeing others accessing, as our social worker says, it, it's making them thirsty. You can't leave the horse to water, right? But it's making them thirsty to want that water. Yeah. Um, and, it, and some are there and some I've seen over a year of just one step forward, two steps back. But you know, at least you're getting that step forward and it's having that patience. Um, and we've seen, you know, people go off to treatment programs or to reunite with families or just to, you know, I've seen settle a court case to um, uh, some, j just to get the stability, to get their life in order. Uh, we've had people stay for a couple of months uh, to people who have been there since day one. So now over two and a half years and it's permanent housing. So they could be there, you know, forever. It's independent living. So obviously there'll be a point in time where uh, it won't work for them anymore. Um, but but there are, there are a lot there um, that will be there for some time. And I think just another thing that kind of surprised me, that's lessons learned. So I'm, I'm jumping all over the maps. I'm sorry about that, Michael. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Is the age. So yeah. the average age, again, and this surprised me, but I guess when I unpacked it, probably shouldn't have. Um, it's an older population. The average age is 59, 60. Yeah. yeah. And so you think of, again, uh, of a veteran, you, you know, you probably think of someone, you know, a homeless person, probably a bit younger, but these people have gone through their careers. They've, they joined the military. They've, you know, served how many years, 10, 15, whatever years, and then you don't become homeless, you know, right on release. And you, it's, it's, it's a bit of a journey spiral downwards. And, and then you go from there. So yeah, I was, uh, uh, I, I was surprised, but again, the more I thought about it, the more I learned about it, it, it makes sense. And so it's, it, it is an old, we do have a, a more, you know, an older population that we have to cater to. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. I, I I understand that. So so let's talk about Alan. And this is just you know your opinion. What has to change? How do we change this? Uh, you know, so our veterans never have to experience homelessness. Uh, what do we need? Yeah. So I think, and I, and I think it's anything different. You know, we need supply of housing supply inventory. Um, we need affordable prices. Um, and we need to, you know, to have programs that cater to veterans now. And I'm sure you're tracking the Veterans Homelessness Program was just, it was, it was announced three years ago, but finally released um, just a few months ago. And matter of fact, application, we've got an application in, um, you know, uh, hopefully this will see where it goes fall for rent supplements and wraparound supports, you know, again, and, and knock on wood. Um, but right now we're not sure how long this program's for. Is this, a, is this one and done? Is this going to be available every year? As we build new buildings across Canada, can we do applications? We've got one for Ottawa, but for new ones that as we build them in a couple of years, will this be around? We're not sure. Uh, but again, so let's go back to rent supplements are, are, are wonderful. Um, and the wraparound support, you know, is, is fantastic. And, and, and I'm super happy with that. But none of those exist unless you've got a place to live. So what's missing? Bricks and mortar. Well said, and, and yes, we need to, to move on that. Now, two two last things. You are presenting at the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness Conference in Halifax in the fall. Can you give us a little taste? What are you going to be talking about? Sure. First of all, I want to recognize the CEH for recognizing veterans homelessness. So last year, I was attended for my first one in Toronto last year, and that was the first time they had the homeless veterans stream. And so I was able to attend that. And again, made a whole bunch of contacts. And again, as part of my education over the last two years is to get smarter on, on this whole topic. And so I was thrilled to see it was coming back uh, in Halifax. And so, you know, I made the proposal that what I want to talk about is the Andy Carswell building experience. Again, by then we'll be almost two and a half years open. And I want to talk about what are the lessons learned uh, with the building? What are the challenges for building in the future? Because for us, the Andy Carswell building is a pilot project. It's one of of a bunch more we want. And we have certainly had some lessons, some of the challenges that we face. So again, what are the good things? What have we learned? And what are the challenges we be facing? And that's what I'd like to talk about uh, with a bunch of other practitioners um, in, in the Halifax this November. Very cool. And lastly, if people want to, I think there's so many people that would say, I would love to support, I'd love to get behind this. I'd love to find out more. Where can they go, Alan? Yeah, so yeah, we have a uh, veteranshousecanada.ca is our website. Um, and so there you can have a, have a look at the Andy Carswell building, some great photos. There's a bunch of news articles. You can see, you know, where we've been involved in advocacy as well. It's not, not just focus on us, but the greater picture. Um, you know, if I can have the donate here button is at the top. So feel free to, to hit that. Um, and we look at our plans. And so 
uh, we were looking at expanding four more homes in the next five years across Canada. And we are working with various cities. We've reached out to provinces, reached out to cities, uh, because to be successful, you need three things, right? Land, money, and a willing partners. Yes. Um, and so those are our challenges. And land, I thought around land being the most challenging um, because it's just so expensive these days. And so we work through all those. And so if you take a look on there, um, you can have a look at what we're about, what our plans are. You'll see some testimonials. You'll see some pictures of the Andy Carswell building. Um, and also any every social media links, you'll see links there. So we're on, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, uh, we're on LinkedIn. And as we try to just make sure that, you know, A, we tell our, our story, but also again, the advocacy and just the highlight the awareness of veterans homelessness as part of the, the bigger, bigger ecosystem of trying to do good. Amazing. Well, listen, Alan, thank you so much to you and the team at Veterans House Canada. Thank you for your service, but also thank you for your new service uh, to people experiencing homelessness. It is so appreciated. We appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me and best of luck in the future. Thanks, Alan. We'll see you next time on The Take Way care. Home.